So yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome back to another um, uh, ID Epi seminar series. Um, this is presented and hosted by the Centre for Communicable Disease Dynamics at the Harvard Teach Chan School of Public Health. Uh, I'm your moderator again this week. Um, my name's James. Um, I'm really excited today to um, present to you uh, Dr. Colin Russell, who's a professor of applied evolutionary biology at the Amsterdam University Medical Center. So I'll just go through a few logistics before we start. Um, as you just heard, the seminar is being recorded. So uh, please do turn off your cameras and mute yourselves if you do not wish to be recorded. And the recording will be made available um, later on. So we have approximately 40 minutes and then we'll stop for questions. Um, throughout the talk, if you ha do have questions, please send them um, by direct message to uh, Flavia Kompanova in the chat box function, and then we can uh, compile those and ask them at the end. So I'll just briefly introduce uh, Dr. Russell. So, so Dr. Russell's uh, research interests are uh, very broad. They are largely in the understanding of evolution of pathogens at multiple scales. And so he's published seminal work on the global spread, spread of influenza, on the predictability of influenza virus evolution, and on the link between within host viral and immune dynamics and epidemiology. So today he's going to be talking about his group's recent work on linking within and between host evolutionary mechanisms. Um, so with that, I'll reiterate our thanks to Dr. Russell for joining us and hand over to him. So take it away, Dr. Russell. Um, James, thank you very much for inviting me and uh, for you all for showing up for this, this virtual seminar. Um, you know, I think like everyone, I look forward to the day when we can do these things in person again. Um, but in the meantime, we sit behind our computers and pretend to be talking directly to one another. Um, <clears throat> so as, as James said, uh, this talk today is looking at how the within host and between host dynamics of influenza viruses interact with one another to give us the evolutionary patterns that we see at the global scale. Um, I'd like to start off by acknowledging uh, the people who really did this work. Uh, and, the, and the groups that funded it. Uh, so in particular, I'd like to point out Dylan Morris, who really was the one who led a lot of the work that I'll be talking about today, and Veloslava Petrova as well, as she really gave a lot of the fundamental uh, immunological insights to us that uh, really fueled our modeling work. Um, and just briefly, this work was supported by the ERC, the Wellcome Trust, and the National Institutes of Health. Um, so, in talking about the evolutionary dynamics of seasonal influenza viruses, we have to dichotomize between pandemic influenza and seasonal influenza. Um, so pandemics start when an animal or a group of animals give their viruses to humans and then that virus adapts for human to human transmission and then spreads around the world. Now, I think we've all probably seen this cute picture of the kid licking the pig. Um, and of course, in this context, we're assuming that the direction of the virus is from pig to human. However, in general, the threat is actually very much larger the other way around, where humans pose a much greater risk to pigs than pigs do to humans. But that's a completely different talk. Um, but really, the seminal bit here is that pandemics involve animal viruses being transmitted to humans, whereas human seasonal influenza viruses are always in humans, and they don't require any external introductions into the human population in order for circulation to occur year after year after year. So in general, roughly 5 to 15% of the world's population is infected each year, and this results in millions of hospitalizations and approximately 500,000 deaths. Now, we have all been infected with seasonal influenza viruses multiple times over the course of our lives, and in large part, that's due to the evolution of the virus. Um, in that way, the virus continually evolves to escape immunity that has been induced by prior infections and vaccinations. And so you can be infected again and again and again. Um, to understand how this happens, we're going to take a, a brief look at a schematic of an influenza virus. So looking at this influenza virus that we see here, we see that the surface of the virus is dominated by two proteins. There is the hemagglutinin, which is shown in this sort of blue color, and neuraminidase, which is shown in red. Now, this talk will largely focus on the evolution of the hemagglutinin protein because it's the primary target of our immune response, and it's also the primary component of influenza vaccines. So in the context of thinking about how influenza viruses evolve in response to population immunity, we're really concentrating on the evolution of the hemagglutinin. Now, the way that antibody escape works is really remarkably simple. Here, we're looking at a schematic of the influenza trimer, uh, which is one of the proteins that's on the surface of the virus. And largely, antibodies focus on the globular head, primarily because it's the most exposed and because antibodies that interfere with the receptor binding site block the virus's ability to intercells. And so in that way, they're very efficient at neutralizing the virus. Now, 
antibodies initially bind on to the surface of the human gluten. Um, however, mutations in and around the receptor binding site have the potential to reduce antibody cross-reactivity. And the accumulation of these mutations over time mean that antibodies eventually that were generated to prior infections and vaccinations no longer recognize new antigenic variants. So looking at this antigenic variation over time, for those of you who work in flu, showing you an image that you have all seen many times before, uh, for those of you who haven't worked in flu, what we're looking at here is an antigenic map. And basically, both of the axes on this map are distance. In that way, you can turn the map upside down and all of the information remains the same. Now, each one of the blobs in this map is a virus. And the distance between points in this map is a measure of antigenic similarity as seen by antibodies. So if we talk through an example for a moment, um, the virus is up at the top of this map labeled 1968. These are the H3N2 viruses that caused the 1918, uh, 1968 uh, human influenza pandemic. And if you were infected or vaccinated with one of those purple viruses, you'd probably be protected against reinfection with one of those purple viruses. However, so these viruses circulated for about four years from 1968 to 1972. And then in 1972, we had the emergence of these turquoise viruses. Now, if you were last infected or vaccinated with one of these purple viruses up at the top, you stand a reasonable chance of getting infected with one of these turquoise viruses. But anyways, these turquoise viruses circulate from 1972 to about 1975. And in 1975, we have the emergence of these uh, yellow viruses. Now, if your last exposure or vaccination had been to the 1968 variant, you're almost certainly susceptible to reinfection with that 1975 virus. But in this way, we have this periodic emergence of new antigenic variants over time, where we see new clusters emerging every two to five years. Every time one of these new antigenic variants emerges, you have to update the influenza vaccine, because in order for the vaccine to maintain its effectiveness, it has, the viruses in the vaccine have to match the viruses that are circulating in the human population. Now, importantly, every time we see one of these new antigenic variants emerge, the old antigenic variants that had been circulating previously go rapidly extinct. So basically, we see this sequential replacement over time. Now, all of this says that the population level advantage for new antigenic variants is strong by virtue of the fact that old antigenic variants go extinct when new antigenic variants emerge, suggests that there's a strong population level advantage for those variants. Now, interestingly though, the mutational uh, barrier to the creation of new antigenic variants is incredibly low. So some work that was done by Bjorn Kohl, who used to be in my group at, at Amsterdam, and uh, this work was done while he was in the lab of Ron Fouché, showed that only a handful of substitutions are involved in the antigenic evolution of seasonal influenza viruses. So in the antigenic map that we were just looking at, Bjorn created every possible single amino acid variant between the variant viruses that circulated in 1968, all the way up to the viruses that circulated in 2004. And what he found was pretty striking, which was that there were just seven amino acid positions around the receptor binding site on the influenza hemagglutinin that were responsible for the majority of antigenic change that has been observed from 1968 up to the present day. And importantly, in many instances, a single amino acid substitution was sufficient to generate a new antigenic variant. And so in that way, the mutational barrier for new variants is incredibly low. So this gives rise to two basic questions. Why is influenza virus antigenic evolution punctuated? Why don't we see the gradual accumulation of mutations that lead to antigenic change over time? And two, why is antigenic evolution so slow? If only a single amino acid is required to create a new antigenic variant, why don't we see new antigenic variants evolve all the time instead of only two to every two to five years as we see them currently? These are not new questions by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, studies uh, have looked at them for at least two decades now. And there, people have come up with a lot of potential explanations. So one of the most highly cited explanations is that of neutral networks, where basically a virus has to explore a genetically neutral network or a genetically neutral space in order to be able to access substitutions that lead to antigenic change. Alternatively, 
maybe uh, viruses carry around a deleterious mutation load. And so it's not enough just for a virus to get a substitution that gives it a, an antigenic change. It, that antigenic change has to also happen in the right genetic background. And so the time required for the creation of new antigenic variants is a function of finding the right mutation in the right background. And then finally, a, a third uh, explanation is that antigenic mutations themselves are deleterious in that way that um, the substitutions that lead to antigenic change, they themselves actually compromise virus fitness in a way that has to be later compensated for. Now, one of the things that's interesting about all of these studies is that um, basically they effectively all make the two of the same assumptions. Um, one is that antigenic evolution is ultimately constrained by the virus itself. It, they fundamentally assume that selection pressure is strong and that it's always there. And that's down to the fact that they all assume that immunity comes from a strong and constant antibody response whereby if you have been infected previously, you have a strong antibody response from the moment that you're affected and it's always on and it's highly efficient at selecting for new antigenic variants. While both of these ideas are on some level reasonable, um, there's no good evidence for either of them. And that's partially what we sought to challenge in the work that we did. Um, now, one of the things that uh, it becomes increasingly clear, uh, has become increasingly clear over the last five, 10 years, is that the within host variation of influenza viruses is very low, even in individuals who we would expect to have a good immune response to the viruses they're being infected with. So uh, since about 2016, there have been four uh, within host uh, diversity next generation sequencing based studies that have looked at about 350 influenza A virus infected humans. And what they found is pretty striking. So here we've summarized uh, the findings of those studies in a bar graph, and we've broken the participants of these studies down into two groups those individuals that were vaccinated in the year that they were infected, and those individuals who weren't vaccinated. And we observe three kinds of substitutions in those individuals. First, there are individuals who basically have no obvious mutations that would affect antigenicity. And those are shown in the light gray portions of these bars. And then there's the individuals who have antigenic mutations in those positions that have been shown to be strongly associated with influenza virus antigenic change. Those are labeled ridge. And in both of these cases, vaccinated or not, that's only a single individual who has any mutations in those positions. And then the other individuals shown in dark gray have mutations in putative antigenic sites. These are sites that could affect antigenic change, but there's no uh, evidence to suggest that they have a strong effect in the particular background that they were observed. Now, <clears throat> more than two thirds of the individuals in these studies were vaccinated in the year that they were infected. And yet they don't show a markedly different distribution of selection of antigenic variants as those individuals who weren't vaccinated. And importantly, the distribution of antigenic substitutions that we observe in these individuals is not that different from what we would expect to see by chance. And all of this basically suggests that selection is weak. Going further, all of the antigenic variation associated substitutions that were observed in these individuals were observed at less than 10% frequency within those individuals, suggesting that if selection is operating, it's not operating efficiently in these individuals. So this really gives rise to a third question, which is how can we reconcile strong population level selection pressure that results in sequential replacement of antigenic variants over time with weak within host selection for those antigenic variants? And this is where Dylan and Velislava and I all, all working together really had what, what to, to us seemed like an epiphany, which was, why don't we actually consider the immunokinetics that happen within these individuals and look to see whether or not that might explain what's happening within host. And our hypothesis was this, that influenza virus evolution is fundamentally, lim fundamentally limited by the asynchrony between virus replication and antibody selection pressure. So this was something that we had started working on as a nice idea. And while we were working on it, um, uh, there was a very nice review paper that was published in the Journal of Immunology that did a lot of the homework for us in terms of justifying the timings of the uh, antibody-based immune response. Now, importantly, 
one of the reasons that such a review was required in the first place is that we actually don't have a good handle on what happens to an individual immunologically in the first two or three days post-infection. Now, day four, quantities like B cell activation and antibodies start to become measurable. But during those first two or three days, we're basically operating in a black box because it's very difficult to measure any changes in those individuals in terms of their immune response. And particularly for the phenomena that we were seeking to study, we need to focus on this graph down here at the bottom. So in the shaded gray area, we see influenza virus viral load, basically. And it's a bit generous to say that it goes out to 14 days, but the timing of the kinetics at the beginning of infection are very reasonable, where we see a peak in virus titer within 24 to 48 hours post-infection. Now, if an individual is experiencing their first influenza virus infection, we need to be paying attention to this blue curve, which is, says GC response, and that's a germinal center response. Now, basically, in a, in a previously in influenza-naive individual, it's going to take that individual at least seven to 10 days to even start making antibodies, let alone actually having an effective response uh, against the virus that's infecting them. Uh, so in that way, the vast majority of virus replication is going to happen before any antibody pressure could be exerted upon those viruses. Now, even in experienced individuals though, unless the uh, circulating or secreted antibodies manage to block infection in the first place, even experienced individuals are going to have to wait three to five days for the generation of new antibodies. And this is being shown by that red curve that's labeled EF, which is for extra follicular response. So in this way, even in experienced individuals where infection isn't blocked at the site of infection, the vast majority of virus replication would be expected to occur before the antibody response really has an opportunity to play a meaningful role in slowing down an infection. And this importantly correlates with another phenomenon as well, which is that uh, viral load is closely associated with the extent of virus shedding. And so higher the viral load, the more virus that's going to be actively shed. And so here in the bottom panel, we're looking at some virus shedding data from naturally acquired infections. And what we see is that the peak of virus transmission is happening around day zero in terms of symptom onset. And that's reasonable because there's usually a 24 to 36 hour delay between exposure to the virus and beginning to have symptoms, which generally corresponds to the peak in viral within the host viral titer. And what we see is that virus shedding is highest very early on in infection. And what this means is that even in experienced individuals, we're unlikely to see any antibody selection pressure on the virus to change until after the majority of transmission events have already taken place. So of course, describing all of these patterns qualitatively is fine, but what we wanted to do was create a mathematical model to explore the extent to which these sorts of phenomena might be limiting the opportunities for influenza viruses to evolve. And so we created a relatively straightforward within host model of influenza virus evolution. So we basically have influenza viruses that infect host cells and they produce many, many progeny per cell. And for each virus replication, variants are produced by the influenza, influenza virus uh, polymerase. And at the error rate, which is best guess, the current best guess anyways, is about three times 10 to the minus five mutations per site per replication. Now, given the relatively modest length of the influenza virus genome, this means that on average, each influenza virus is going to have one nucleotide uh, error per, uh, per uh, round of replication. Now, <clears throat> in terms of looking at the model, we first looked at an influenza naive host. So this is an individual that we wouldn't expect to mount in, uh, a recall or a memory antibody response early in infection. And we're looking at three quantities in, in the context of model output here. So we have the wild type virus that infects that individual shown in blue. We have the red line showing variant virus. And here we assume that a new antigenic variant can be uh, created through a single nucleotide substitution, which results in a single amino acid substitution. So this is overall a tiny minority of the genome reflective of what occurs in a, in a normal influenza virus genome, um, but that much like we've observed experimentally, it's very easy to create a new antigenic variant. And then in green, we're just showing host cells as the sort of fuel for the infection environment. 
Now, the shaded area of these plots represents the timing of the antibody response. And for the purposes of these uh, experiments, we basically assume that the antibody response comes on full blast as soon as you see that gray shaded area. So in a naive individual, we assume that between day six and day seven, the antibody response comes on strong and kicking. Now, in the top plot, we're looking at the number, absolute numbers of virions and cells. And so what we see is that in even a naive infection, the infection is going to be dominated by wild type virus, but variant viruses will be produced. And that's simply because the influenza virus polymerase is sufficiently error prone that we are going to make antigenic variants in every single infected individual. However, the important bit is the frequency with which those, with the frequency which, with which those variants reach in the context of that infection. And so in the bottom plot, we're looking at variant frequency as a total proportion of infection. And what we see is though variants are created, they're incredibly rare within that infected individual just because, well, the polymerase error rate is high, but it's not that high. And importantly, those variants are very unlikely to cross the 1% threshold that's necessary for detection by NGS. And so in this way, variants should be created, but they shouldn't be detectable. Now, if we assume what previous studies have effectively assumed, which is that there is a constant recall response, we have an overlap between replication and selection by antibodies because the antibodies are present from the very beginning and they can exert selection pressure. Now, many individuals are not going to be infected at all. However, infection against uh, antibody protection against infection with influenza viruses is never perfect. And so in this way, some individuals will still get infected and every reinfection of a previously infected individual should result in the creation of a new antigenic variant. And those variants are likely to occur sufficiently early in infection that we would expect to see them transmitted from host to host. And so in this way, this just can't be a parsimonious explanation unless we consider the other explanations uh, described previously for a constraining factor on the evolutionary dynamics of seasonal influenza viruses. However, if we delay that recall response just to a reasonable extent, which mirrors what we actually see in terms of B cell dynamics, we now have an antibody response that starts after the peak of virus replication. And we do see variants appear late in infection. And they could even reach detectable levels very late in infection. However, at that point, virus titers are going to be low. CT, CT scores are going to be very low as well. And their viruses, these new variants are unlikely to be transmitted. But importantly, this delay in recall response, but ability to select for antigenic variants late in infection has important implications for immunocompromised individuals. Uh, because basically immunocompromised doesn't mean that the immune system doesn't work at all. It just means it doesn't work well enough to really stymie an infection. And so under these sorts of circumstances, we could see the proliferation of antigenic variants because we would have viruses replicating in the presence of selection pressure multiple days or weeks into an infection. But in general here, we're concentrating on typical influenza virus infections, not so much in immunocompromised individuals. So this gets back to a very basic immunological question, which is if we don't have a constant antibody response, then how does protection against virus infection actually work? Well, there are three key elements that aren't being shown in the schematic that I, I presented earlier. Um, so the first is the innate immune response. So our innate immune response, and this is things like interferons and cytokines and mucus in our upper respiratory tract actually does a remarkably good job at limiting uh, infection in the first place. And so we're frequently exposed to pathogens with which we are not infected just by virtue of the fact that our innate immune systems generally do a pretty good job. We're also not looking at T cells here. And T cells are incredibly important for virus clearance and could even have a role in blocking infection. However, T cells don't exert any antibody selection pressure on the virus or any selection pressure on the antigenic phenotype of the virus. And so they're unlikely to provide a meaningful explanation of the phenomena that we're exploring. But one of the things that is really important that's not being shown that is unequivocally important for blocking infections with influenza viruses and respiratory pathogens in general are IgA antibodies at, mucos at mucosal surfaces. These act at the point of infection and they act before virus replication. 
And this is really important in the context of blocking flu infections, but also creates an opportunity to exert strong selection pressure on a small virus population. So now, if we go back to these model results in the context of looking at a single infected host, if we have a strong IgA response very early on in infection, but it doesn't exist even an hour after viruses have started to infect cells, we can have individuals who are still going to get infected because IgA protection is never perfect. Influenza immunity is not perfect. Um, but what we see there is that because rare variants will occasionally be generated in other hosts. So even in a, in a naive host or in a host that has a delayed recall response, variants will be created. And if they are part of the virus population that is excreted from that individual and excreted into an individual who already has a good SIGA response at a mucosal surface, selection can occur at that point such that we have a new infection with a solely wild type virus. And so in this way, we can generate efficient selection, but efficient selection is going to be rare and limited to individuals who have had a recent influenza virus infection with that antigenic variant. So looking at that more schematically in terms of an overview, if I am, for example, infected with an influenza virus, I actually excrete a pretty substantial number of viruses every day, at least on the order of 10 to the seven viruses just by talking and breathing. Now, the virus population that infects me is diversifying and replicating and expanding all the time. And so there is within host diversity. However, it's only a tiny minority of the viruses that are inside of me. But through the process of excreting these viruses, some of that virus diversity could make it out of me. And that's really the first bottleneck, which is getting out of an infected host. The next bottleneck is getting into another host because imagining we were sitting in a lecture theater right now and I sneeze. Well, the majority of the viruses aren't going to find their way to you. They're just going to die in the air. But some of those viruses will find their way into one or two of you. And then we have that second bottleneck, which is that getting into the next host. But even if you've gotten into the respiratory tract of the next host, there are still multiple additional bottlenecks that you have to survive in order to successfully create a new infection. So the first is the mucus bottleneck. So our respiratory tracts are lined with mucus, and that's actually going to go a long way towards neutralizing uh, a lot of the influenza virus particles to which we are exposed. But in that mucus, we have IgA antibodies, if you've been infected previously. And this is the moment at which selection can operate efficiently because we have a small quantity of viruses encountering a set of well-matched antibodies. And there, they will preferentially recognize variants they've been exposed to previously to the advantage of new antigenic variants represented by the red virus here. And so assuming that the, we have viruses that have survived all of this, we then get to the last bottleneck, which is actually attaching to a cell that is at the right moment in the cell cycle to be infected. So in this way, we go from a, a population being excreted by me of more than 10 to the seven viruses to in general, a population of less than 10 virions that are infecting these new cells. But in this way, we can, if we have a selective bottleneck, create new antigenic variant infections, at least sometimes. This protection though, it depends on cross-reactivity between the wild type and variant viruses. And that's really the critical bit, which is if you were last infected a long time ago, then your body isn't going to care whether or not you're infected with a wild type or with a variant virus. It's only if you have good immunity to a recently circulating variant that the selective effect actually begins to manifest itself. So in this way, if you were last infected with one of these red viruses and you're being challenged by another one of these red viruses, the antigenic difference between them is small. And so your antibodies should do a good job of rapidly neutralizing that new antigenic variant because it's only a very small variation. And so in that way, that new variant only has a very weak selective advantage. In this way, we can effectively have drift within these antigenic clusters where there's no obvious selection for a new antigenic variant. However, if you were last infected with one of these red viruses and you're now being challenged with a green virus, the antigenic difference is large and neutralization is probably not going to be effective for the green virus where it still might be for the red virus. And in this way, selection for a new antigenic variant can be very efficient. 
And taken all together, this gives us drift within clusters where the virus can basically bounce around a little bit with no real advantage, but where we see sweeps when a new antigenic variant emerges. Now, if we look at the evolution of viruses across a chain of infections, this is basically beginning to embed this realistically timed immune response model within a epidemiological framework. If we look at a wholly naive population, and so here on the x-axis, we're looking at net antigenic change over the course of an epidemic. If we look at a wholly na naive population in, in panel A, unsurprisingly, we don't see much antigenic change in the course of an epidemic because the majority of individuals uh, have no capacity to exert uh, an immune, se any immune selection pressure on the virus population they're being infected with. Conversely, if we look at panel B and we assume that there's an immediate recall response, which is basically what most previous studies have assumed, then we would expect to see new antigenic variants appear and dominate in every single epidemic. Um, this is, of course, not what happens and is why previous studies have had to re uh, have required uh, explanations like neutral networks and deleterious mutation load and fitness costs of acquiring antigenic change in order to limit the rate at which antigenic diversity is being generated. Similarly, if we go to panel C and we assume mucosal antibodies provide protection and there's an immediate recall response, in fact, basically we only make selection stronger. So there again, not terribly surprising. However, if we move to mucosal antibodies with a realistic recall response, then in fact, we actually expect epidemics to occur without any meaningful antigenic change over the course of that epidemic. And so in that way, if we have realistic immune kinetics, epidemics without antigenic change become common. And the key thing then becomes the re-inoculation of experienced individuals in order for uh, there to be efficient selection pressure. But selection pressure is never really going to be efficient at the population level because it requires that we have an effectively naive individual who is infected and producing lots of viruses to be in close contact with an individual who has some immunity and gets lucky enough to be exposed to a good balance of wild type virus, but also a little bit of those rare antigenic variants that are likely to be created in every naive host. And so in this way, we get to a picture where within host selection probably isn't that important in the context of influenza virus infections. And in fact, it's shifted one level up to the population whereby variant emergence depends on three factors. It depends on the rate of transmission. It depends on the level of population immunity and it depends on the size of the bottleneck. And so what we're looking at here, the darker the lines that we're looking at indicates the higher true R naught for a virus in a population that's ir irrespective of population immunity. And the dotted lines indicate, indicate uh, simulations where we have a large bottleneck and the solid lines indicate uh, situations where we have a small bottleneck. What we see on the x-axis is the population, uh, proportion of the population that is immune to the wild type virus. And on the y-axis, we're looking at the per capita probability of new variant infections. One of the things to note from the very beginning is that the scale on the y-axis is capped at three times 10 to the minus four, which means that new variants are fundamentally rare, period, in, in terms of the likelihood that a new one will emerge in an individual in the context of one of these transmission events. Um, but in general, what we see is that there is, particularly for large bottlenecks, effectively a sweet spot of population immunity that can result in an increased likelihood of the creation and transmission of new antigenic variants. And that is when there is this good balance between the proportion of population that is immune and capable of selecting, that is still in the presence of a population that is sufficiently naive that an epidemic is likely to take place in the first place, and that is going to be infected in such a way that it creates large numbers of viruses, which increases the probability that a new variant would be created and excreted and then could be potentially selected by one of these individuals who is immune. The important take home in all of this, and it's directly relevant in the context of discussions that seem to be happening purely in the domain of Twitter at this point, which is, uh, in the context of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic and the importance of vaccination there, 
vaccination for seasonal flu for SARS-CoV-2 can fundamentally make evolution slower if we can vaccinate enough people so that the proportion of individuals who are at risk of infection is decreasing. Because for all of these RNA viruses, the really important thing is that the virus is able to infect enough people that it has enough trials to create a new antigenic variant that can be sneezed onto someone who can act as a selector. In this way, especially for typical short-lived infections, influenza viruses in particular are effectively playing a number game where they have to infect large numbers of people before antigenic selection or the, even the creation of antigenic variants becomes likely. Now, some of you might be thinking at this point, okay, well, how likely are these reinfection events that we're talking about in the context of needing someone who is strongly immune to the current wild type virus being exposed to and infected with that wild type virus again, even if it's in combination with a rare antigenic variant or not? And there's not a lot of good data on this, but there is a particularly striking study that was published about 18 months ago now, looking at a reinfection, uh, reinfections in a sequential human challenge study and their implications for protective immunity. So here, this has to be taken with the understanding that we're looking at a human challenge study, which is highly artificial in many respects. Um, and we're only looking at seven individuals. But the important thing here is that the individuals in this challenge study were initially challenged with a laboratory grown, but from a wild type virus, uh, a laboratory grown H1N1 virus. And then when these individuals went back eight to 19 months later, they were challenged with exactly the same virus stock all over again. So if there was good protective immunity, we would expect all of these individuals to walk away scot-free because it's exactly the same virus. But interestingly, three of the seven participants demonstrated confirmed laboratory evidence of sequential infections, and five of the seven had demonstrable clinical evidence of infection. All of this goes to show, basically, that influenza immunology is more complicated than we currently understand it to be. And that protection is not nearly as good as we would like for it to be. And so in this way, reinfections are probably more common than we think. So we started off this talk with two basic questions, which is why is influenza virus evolution punctuated and why is it so slow? Well, in part, uh, why punctuated? Well, because of the timing and nature of selection, uh, only large antigenic differences matter. And so in that way, you can't just accumulate lots of small changes because immunological cross-reactivity amongst influenza viruses acts to constrain those populations. And so it's only once you've found a good advantageous mutation in an individual that can select for it, do you actually see that variant proliferate. The other question though is why so slow? And at least in part, the timing of antibody selection rarely coincides with virus replication. And this basically has the effect of shifting the burden of selection onto the population level. And the accumulation of population immunity there becomes key, but it takes time because it effectively requires a new antigenic variant to circulate before further antigenic variants become likely to emerge and be selected for. And ultimately that requires that a virus circulate around the world for a year or two or three. And particularly when we get into the combination of potential virus interactions with the other seasonal influence viruses, because there are four of them at the end of the day, and we don't see an, uh, an epidemic of each uh, virus each year in every location. So in that way, we can build in a lot of time for the creation of and selection of new antigenic variants just by requiring population immunity to develop first. So you still might be thinking, well, what about the other explanations for antigenic evolution, uh, neutral networks, deleterious mutations, that sort of thing? Well, truth be told, they will all slow evolution down further. However, when you move into a, a modeling framework where you're considering realistic timings of immune responses and selection dynamics, um, they aren't strictly necessary anymore. Um, we can't rule out that they don't play a role, but they aren't likely to be the primary constraint on influenza virus evolution. So only a couple more slides here and then I look forward to your questions. Um, in short, timing really is everything in the context of antigenic evolution. And it fundamentally differs from all other virus phenotypes. Because at least in the context of influenza viruses, 
antigenic evolution is really only likely to be efficient at the very beginning of an, of an infection in individuals who have strong secretory IgA responses at the moment of infection. Conversely, all other virus phenotypes, anything that affects replication, stability, or any other phenotype other than antigenic evolution, has an effective selective advantage throughout the replication spectrum of the virus because anything that affects the replication of that virus will be selected for over the course of that exponential growth phase. But this is not the case for antigenic evolution simply because the pressure isn't there. But this does raise interesting questions about antigenic evolution and immunocompromised people because there the virus is likely to be present long after the, uh, an individual has had an opportunity to begin generating a meaningful antibody response against the virus. And this is something that is seen in the relatively small number of individuals who have been studied, um, immunocompromised individuals who have been studied over the weeks and months that these infections can last in these individuals, where you do see substantial virus diversification. And in some cases, you see evidence of antigenic change in these viruses. And when we take all of this to its extreme, though, and we look at something like HIV, one of the reasons HIV is probably able to evolve so rapidly is that it constantly replicates in the presence of a strong antibody selection pressure. And so in this way, it can rapidly generate new antigenic variants which have selective advantages because of this replication selective advantage that they have. So this basically leaves us with three conclusions. So one, Asynchrony between virus uh, replication and immune selection creates an ecological barrier to evolution where evolution could occur efficiently, but it all boils down to timing. Um, it also suggests that immunocompromised people could be key for virus evolution in general. And this is something that we confront now about uh, in terms of questions about where new antigenic variants of the SARS-CoV-2 virus appear or where they are arising and, and, and how they are evolving. Um, but finally, for flu, though, um, IgA antibodies are critical, but they are understudied. Um, and this is particularly important in two domains relevant for influenza viruses. Um, so first, in considering vaccine formulations, the vast majority of influenza vaccines are given intramuscularly. And intramuscular vaccination definitely has benefits. And in terms of protecting people against flu, Vaccines, even our intramuscular ones, remain our best option. However, uh, intramuscular vaccines are best at generating IgG responses, and they aren't necessarily good at creating IgA responses in the respiratory tract. This is problematic in the context of providing protection against infection because the only meaningful way to provide protection against infection in the first place, this is really sterilizing immunity, is to have an IgA population present at the point of infection. Otherwise, you require time to recruit all of your IgG antibodies across the lumen into the respiratory tract before they can actually begin to slow the infection down. And so while vaccines delivered intramuscularly could be strongly beneficial for reducing disease severity and severe outcomes, they're unlikely to be transmission blocking. And this is probably why intranasal vaccines are so effective in young children, because they actually are very good at generating strong SIGA responses. The other way that uh, these IgA responses are, are important is because of the way we currently estimate protection against infection. And that is we estimate protection by looking at serum antibody titers. Now, serum antibody titers are great for a couple of reasons. So one, they're really easy to collect, just take a simple blood sample, and they're really easy to analyze. However, it's not clear at all whether or not IgG, serum IgG antibody titers have any bearing on IgA antibody titers in your respiratory tract. And so in that way, there's some information in it, at least in the context of the likelihood of preventing, pre preventing severe infection. However, there's not a lot of information about whether or not an individual is likely to be truly immune against getting infected in the first place. And so by better understanding SIG antibodies and better developing vaccines that target the elicitation of IgA antibodies, we can probably go a long way towards better combating flu. So with that, I thank you all very much for your time and attention, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Russell. That was a, an amazingly clear and useful description of such a complex system. Um, so we have yeah, 15 minutes for questions. Um, so please do keep submitting those to Flavia in the chat, and we'll try our best to get through them and accommodate everyone.
Um, but I'm sure Colin will be happy to um, take questions if you want to send one of the organizers of him an email afterwards. Um, okay, so let's have a look through. So I think the first question is um, probably going to be a groan from everyone, but it's related to uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, so the question is, current SARS-CoV-2 vaccines don't seem to induce IgA against infection, and vaccination rates are relatively slow. How would these observations affect the notion that vaccination slows evolution? Well, so there, there's a couple of ways in which vaccination can slow evolution. So one, if you block infections in the first place, then there's no opportunity to evolve. Um, but the other thing is that even if you don't block transmission, but you reduce the levels of virus replication within an individual, you're fundamentally constraining opportunities for evolution in the first place. Because effectively the virus has to reach a, reach a sort of mutation selection limit whereby the uh, possible antigenic variants are being created and then being selected. Um, and so in that way, if you have an individual who is vaccinated but then gets infected, they're probably even less likely to generate an antigenic variant than someone who hasn't been vaccinated just by virtue of the fact that their immune response should kick in and reduce the virus population before it actually has the opportunity to create those antigenic variants with high frequency. Thank you. And uh, a follow-up sort of related question on the kind of co current uh, pandemic context. So do you have any predictions about how global social distancing measures will impact influenza evolution? <laughs> this is the $64,000 question at this point. Um, given how little influenza there is in the world right now. Um, so I, I think WHO between the 4th of January and the 17th of January, they tested something like 200,000 respiratory samples and only found 500 influenza viruses. Normally during this time of year, you would see 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 positives. There's very little flu out there right now. And this could be doing one of two things, right? So one, it could really be slowing evolution down because there aren't very many individuals who are getting infected. The virus isn't having a lot of opportunity to diversify. Maybe evolution has basically become static for the time being. That would be interesting. Um, but alternatively, um, maybe there are pockets of virus circulation that we aren't doing a good job of detecting because of the sort of reallocation of our resources into SARS-CoV-2 surveillance. And in fact, the lack of travel at the moment, and some people are social distancing, some people aren't doing such a great job of that, um, could be leading to pockets of new diversity, basically, where we have these sort of small island uh, meta populations that are leading to the creation of new antigenic variants. But the short answer is, right now, we don't know. My bet is that evolution is just going very slowly right now, but, but, I'm ready to be wrong uh, six months from now when we have lots of data that says that the virus is diversifying that crazy. And do you, do you suspect that um, reduced exposure in the past 12 months is gonna have created a, uh, a bigger opportunity for more explosive seasonal influenza outbreaks in the coming years? This is, this is a great question. Um, so it seems like immunity to natural infection wanes much more slowly than immunity induced by vaccinations. Um, now, if we assume that uh, seasonal influenza viruses are basically exploiting as much of their susceptibility niche as they can every year, whereby the 5 to 10% of people who get infected are the 5 to 10% who could get infected, then there's definitely going to be an increase in the proportion of the population that is susceptible. However, we still don't really have a good handle on what drives the size of influenza virus epidemics. So one would hypothesize from first principles that when you see a new antigenic variant emerge, that that's when you would see the largest epidemics. And sometimes you do, and sometimes you don't. Sometimes it's the second or third time that that virus causes an epidemic, that that's when you see the largest, uh, when you see the largest of those epidemics. And to that end, we also still have a long way to go towards understanding how the emergence of new antigenic variants affects the epidemiology of flu, because the picture is really muddy at the moment. Absolutely. Um, okay, so next question. Uh, it seems like a, a viral strain that replicates faster with the host would be better at evading immune responses. So um, the question, um, this, the person asking is wondering if there are any studies suggesting a selection signal or selection history for increasing the replication rate of the virus. Huh. 
So I have to think about it a little bit just because replication by itself is, is an advantage. And so if you can replicate more quickly, you are going to, uh, you, you are going to proliferate as a variant. But whether or not that would necessarily coincide with antigenic adaptation, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I think that if you were in a variant that replicated appreciably faster than the wild type variant that's infecting the virus, and you replicated so fast that you completely outrun the immune response still, that you would have a distinct advantage in terms of replication, but you would be even less likely to generate a new antigenic variant, assuming that you weren't already a new antigenic variant. If you were a new antigenic variant that could replicate faster, you're, you're the winner of everything. You get a trophy. Yeah, and a kind of related question um, that I, I, I thought when you were presenting the, um, the very first bit of modeling results is, have you considered how the kind of um, the timing which variants could arise on those different scenarios would interact with, say, like the generation interval. So the, the likely probability of transmitting onwards, because because all these kind of thing, things you discuss are kind of assuming there's a uniform probability of transmission onwards across that course. I mean, if, if that window is kind of really constrained to certain points, does that affect things? Yeah. So if we if we assume that the transmission window is constrained right to the beginning of infection then in many respects, it's unsurprising that there isn't antigenic change just because there's no opportunity for selection to occur. Um, now, if we look at the infections in young children, for example, just in terms of places where we know there's really strong heterogeneity in infection, um, young children can routinely be infected for a week or two weeks. I mean, that's, that's, that's normal. Um, there's still not usually enough time for selection to operate efficiently in them because one of the reasons that the, those, those infections last longer is that they don't really have good immunity against the virus already. And so there's nothing to slow the virus down. Um, but you can imagine that these sort of heterogeneities exist throughout the population. I might be infected for a week, but you might be infected for 10 days. And therein, there is this sort of sliding window where it's probably not constrained just to the beginning of infection. It probably can go out beyond that as well. But how far beyond that early point in infection is a big question. Now, let's say that it can happen, but it's a relatively rare event. Well, that could be important in the context of transmitting new variants, uh, just because, well, it, viruses had more time to evolve within a host. And then provided it can be excreted efficiently at that point and still ends up in a person in which it can be selected, that's really valuable. But to this end, I think there's one thing that I didn't touch on in the talk, but that's also important, which is that the effective R of seasonal flu is only about 1.2. And that means the vast majority of transmission chains are going to go rapidly extinct. And so not only do you need to be a new antigenic variant that appears in an individual who sneezes on someone who already has some immunity, that individual then needs to be sufficiently well connected to other people that it becomes likely that they transmit to yet other people. And basically we just have a, a sequence of rare events there, which I would argue that just takes a lot of time for them to all coincide with one another. It's, it's tough to be an antigenic variant these days, isn't it? <laughs> So little time, so much competition. <laughs> so um, next question is, um, what is the role of individuals with primary immunodeficiency? Do they often have very low or absent IgA and or low IgG? Are there different ramifications from low IgA and low IgG? So in, in terms of the ramifications, we don't really know. I mean, the, the within host evolutionary dynamics of influenza viruses have only been studied in a handful of, any, of individuals in any meaningful sense. And so really, I can think of studies that take us up to a total of about 10 people. And that doesn't really give us the opportunity to dichotomize between different forms of immunodeficiencies or different states of IgA and IgG responses. Um, one of the things that is clear is that not all immunocompromised infections result in the emergence of antigenic variants. And that, that's not to say that they transmit, but it's just that antigenic variants even evolve within those individuals. And that could be due to a lack of coherent IgA, IgG uh, immune responses against the viruses that are infecting them. Um, it is also possible that there are other constraints on the virus to evolve its antigenic phenotype. I mean, some of these fitness constraints that have been hypothesized previously could be playing in a role in those individuals. We don't really know, um, but it is clear that in those individuals, there is both the time and opportunity and the occasional occurrence in which antigenic variants do potentially evolve in them. Thank you. So this next one, um, 
It's a bit of a long question, so you'll have to bear with me. Um, but could you comment a bit on the relative distribution and concentration of mucus secreted IgA and different linkages and lengths of sialic acid chains within the respiratory tract? I'm curious about whether sites that are particularly enriched with sialic acids um, that immune, uh, human influenza viruses bind to efficiently are also sites in which IgA is found in strong concentrations. Is this data available? I can I can repeat that or post it in yeah, the no, chat of no, no, no. I, I think I think the short answer is it's not available. And it's, it's really, I, I think there are a wealth of opportunities in the context of studying, well, mu mucosal immunology in general is, 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 a, is a hot area, but particularly in the context of respiratory virus infections and even just understanding the within host heterogeneity in sites of infection, it, it, just in terms of an individual's respiratory tract. I don't know of any good, well-controlled studies that look at the differences between the differences between the left and right nostril of an individual in terms of the extent to which those virus populations would be well mixed, let alone when we get into things that are beginning to interact with the immune response that might be happening in different sites within the respiratory tract. So fabulous question, fabulous area to explore from uh, an immunological and virological perspective. I think related, um, you know, I was very interested in your last discussion point about, um, you know, the importance of considering um, SIGA in, in uh, considering things like vaccine development. Do you, I mean, given your kind of, um, you know, the people you work with in Cambridge and kind of vaccine um, strain selection committees, do you, do you foresee like a kind of change in the sorts of data that go into kind of formulating these decisions? Do you foresee IGA becoming like a, a key part of the decision process? Um, so... I think first and foremost, the, the vaccine strain selection process at WHO, I think they're always ready to consider new information and consider new strategies when they are obviously viable. And here, I think we're, we're, we're at least a step too far removed from that at this point in time. Um, there are influenza vaccines that are good at eliciting SIGA in the upper respiratory tract. And these are particular the intranasal vaccines that we give to kids. Um, now, for reasons that we don't entirely understand, these vaccines don't work in adults. Um, and so you don't get intranasal vaccines in adults very often just because, well, uh, maybe because they have SIGA and it actually takes care of the vaccine particles before they have an opportunity to elicit a strong immune response. Um, but one of the things that would be really exciting is to actually understand uh, the differences in terms of receptor binding uh, and, and understand the differences in binding patterns between IgA antibodies and IgG. I mean, are there differences in the, the, the epitopes that are targeted by the anti antibodies that exist in the respiratory tract versus the ones that we derive from sera? And we don't have good answers to those questions yet, but there are things that we should have answers to. I mean, it's possible that SIGA antibodies exert a fundamentally different selection pressure on the virus from serum antibodies. And we've studied everything really deep in the context of serum antibodies and what we'd expect them to do. But the virus doesn't come in contact with serum antibodies because the virus never becomes viremic. It never goes into our blood and it's only dealing with stuff that's actually in the respiratory tract. And so there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, but once it is done, we can probably go a long way towards making better vaccines. Fantastic. Well, I think that's a really good note to end on. Um, and okay. I think the, uh, the flow of questions has um, stymied a bit. Uh, so let's just um, thank uh, Dr. Russell again for an absolutely fantastic talk. And um, so I just say uh, thank you to everyone for coming on behalf of uh, the Centre for Communicable Disease Dynamics and the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Um, and so I'm assuming, uh, Colin, that you're happy if um, people send us questions that we can um, forward them on to you. By all means. Excellent. Um, so yeah, um, thank you everyone again for joining um, and please do check the uh, CCDD website to stay up to date um, with on upcoming seminars and to see a recording of this talk if you would like. Great. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining. Sounds great. Thank you. Goodbye.